Well, we do uh, follow that up with a dynamic duo brought to us by BDO to help you learn how to purchase with confidence by analyzing your capital purchases all before you write the check. Uh, we are pleased to introduce to you now Dennis Sudo and Jeff Rempel. Now, Dennis grew up on a cattle and grain farm south of Lethbridge. After attending the University of Calgary and Okanagan College, he began his career in public accounting in Vernon, B.C. He obtained his uh, chartered accountant designation in 1998 and then uh, ended up moving back to Lethbridge to work and raise his family. He joined the Lethbridge BDO office in 2000, where he's now a partner. He's also completed the CPA Canada in-depth tax course. Don't we all wish we could do that? Um, and he is also a member of the BDO Farm and Business Transition Team. And there he is able to work closely with a number of clients in farm succession and transition. And that's uh, such an important topic as well. Now, Jeff uh, comes to us uh, from just to the east. He was born and raised on a mixed farm in southwest Saskatchewan, uh, raising cattle and seasonal poultry, so I guess he knows how to pick up chicks, and he also grew grain. He is a University of Saskatchewan agro, and he graduated with a major in ag economics and ag business management from there. Now, his career began in the finance world as an ag and small business account manager before changing his focus to agriculture risk management and financial consulting. And then he moved over to BMO, and that's where he loves to be able to sit down with his clients and get to know them to help build strategies to support profitable operations. He and his family uh, live uh, southwest of Okotoks on a small hobby farm. So we're looking forward to Jeff and Dennis to help us understand what financial statements can tell us about us and also to the bank. Jeff and Dennis. Good afternoon. Uh, I don't know why they put the accountants right after lunch. I hope you can stay awake, but we're going to try to talk to you a little bit today about, about capital purchases and some of the financial information that's important for you to, to have at your fingertips when you go to your lenders. Um, as you know, it's really important to have a, a strong relationship with your lenders and your, your financial advisors. So I, I don't know how many of you have met with your accountants or bankers this week, but maybe, maybe give them a call and, and meet with them and, and establish that relationship. It's very important. So uh, they can help you navigate through a lot of uncertainties and, and uh, through opportunities that you might face as well. Some of these uh, uncertain times, or these unprecedented times of uncertainty include fluctuating commodity prices. I don't need to tell you if you had a contract for 850 Durham and you went delivered it when it was 22, but how that works can be kind of depressing sometimes. Uh, weather extremes that uh, you're, you're well aware of as well. Uh, environmental regulations, rising input costs, supply, supply chain disruptions. Those are all challenges and, and, and certain things that we face, uh, you face as, as producers. So my portion of this presentation is going to talk a little bit just about the balance sheet. I'm going to sound like your accountant probably when you meet with him at the end of the year. Uh, I'm going to talk about three ratios on that, that balance sheet. So uh, just moving ahead, there's going to be some graphs in here. The uh, most... Lenders have a threshold that they want you to meet. You'll see those on your loan agreements often. Uh, on these graphs, <laughs> the red line represents uh, what your lender's looking for, and the blue line represents where you're at. So, uh, and, and the objective isn't just to meet that, it's often to exceed that uh, as a producer. So I just wanted to kind of uh, stress the importance of sound financial reporting and the importance of having these reports at your fingertips, not just from your accountant at the end of the year, but on a regular basis. Um, in today's world, it's really not, just looking at your bank balance isn't gonna uh, help you assess your success. And, and also, uh, owning dirt doesn't guarantee success. Um, it's really how you're employing that dirt that matters. So financial statements, the balance sheet, I'm just going to run through this really quickly. I'm going to try this pointer thing they told me to try to use. This is uh, the asset side of your balance sheet, as you've probably all seen. This is what you own. Uh, in there, we'll have uh, current assets. Those are assets usually that you can liquidate in the short term within the year and turn into cash. And of course, you have your long-term assets here, which is often property, plant, and equipment. Might include land as well. Um, those long-term assets really are the, the assets that help you produce this, the cash. 
Uh, so those are the two items on the balance on the asset side of the balance sheet that I wanted to, to just have a quick look at. And uh, going through the liabilities and shareholders equity section, this really shows you what you have in the game versus what your lenders have and what you owe your lenders. So um, you'll have your equity section and you'll have maybe a shareholder loan here uh, that represents the amount that you have in the game at the moment. You might see with some new accounting rules, some preferred shares here, this 522 might move up to the liability section. There's some new rules this year that will uh, require that to happen. But when your banker looks at this, they're going to take usually take that uh, due to shareholder or that shareholder loan and those preferred shares and move it down to the equity side of the balance sheet. So um, then you have your liabilities, of course, what you owe to third parties. So those are the, the concepts really that we're going to look at with regards to these ratios. So the three ratios I'm going to look at, uh, working capital ratio, your debt service ratio, and your debt to equity ratio. Um, I guess, I don't know how, how many producers here can calculate their debt service ratio. <laughs> um, it, so I, I guess it's important to understand um, where you're sitting to have the ability to calculate that ratio. So that hopefully we can help you through this here today. The first ratio though that I'm going to look at is a working capital ratio. It's, it's short term focused. It uh, goes over one production cycle. And it's focused again on the balance sheet. So we're going to go back down to that balance sheet here. We're going to look at your current assets here, $897,000. That's what you can uh, liquidate to cash if you needed to within the current year. You got $540,000 of current liabilities that you're going to need to pay in the next year. So in this case, you can see we take 897 divided by the 540. It comes out to a current ratio of about 1.66, which is a positive current ratio. I think you'll see on your bank agreements, and the bankers might disagree with me, it's usually about 1.25 to 1. Uh, so this producer himself is in a, in a good position with regards to the current ratio. Um, one thing I wanted to mention here as we go back to the short-term focus, um, some of the consequences, if you're offside, you might have to move oper inventory at an inopportune time. You might miss loan payments. You might incur higher interest charges from your, from your suppliers. Some of the corrective actions that you might um, be able to do if you're offside on your current ratio, you might liquidate long-term investments, arrange bridge financing, or lower, lower and extend your blended loan payments so that more of that goes into the long-term liability section. The debt service ratio, this is the important one. And I'm not going to go too in-depth on it. Jeff is going to talk, I think, a little bit about that and look at projections as, as to... Uh, if, you, if you're assessing a capital purchase, how that might affect this debt service ratio. Um, generally, what it's looking for is whether in your profits, your after-tax profits from cash are able to make your loan principal and interest payments. So generally, uh, the threshold that your lender is looking for here is, again, one, about 1.25 to 1. Um, if you're offside, it could mean that you're denied new loans, your existing loans aren't renewed, things like that. Um, in this case, in this graph, you can see that the, the producer is below the threshold uh, with a factor of about 0.92. Um, some things that he might do to correct that would be to sell redundant assets or, ex again, extend terms on your loan. Um, so it's important to say, or to mention that this uh, ratio is often calculated differently for different types of producers. So it's important to talk to your banker and understand exactly how they're going to calculate that ratio for you. It's a, it's a very important ratio, as, as Jeff will, will talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit about the debt to equity ratio. This is kind of, uh, I guess, what we call the worst case scenario. This is probably, uh, if everything else fails, they, they look to this and, and um, as, as at, at this ratio. So again, um, if you're offside on that, some implications, you might have to, to sell some productive assets. Your loans might be called for repayment. I might not be able to carry on operations. So here we go. Uh, 
we're looking at that liability and shareholders equity side of the statement. Um, you're comparing what you owe to, to third parties versus what you have in the game. So in this example, uh, for every dollar of equity, the producer has one a dollar twenty-five of debt. So they're in a, in a fairly uh, tough position. Uh, they're below the threshold. Uh, generally, what lenders are looking for here is at least one to one. Um, so some corrective actions they might have to uh, undertake would be to look to reduce operating expense, uh, liquidate non-productive assets, or reduce labor costs. One thing that the bank might do in this case, and, and you're well aware of the land values right now and how they can affect um, your operation and how the lenders look at your operation. Um, often on the balance sheet, your land, for example, might be at cost, which might be well below what it's worth. So uh, again, as a last resort, kind of a, yeah, a last resort or a, um, a fallback ratio, I guess you'd call it, they might fall back and look at the fair market value of the assets rather than the cost of the assets, of the net assets, compared to your debt. So that will often um, allow the producer to um, have a better ratio with regards to their debt to equity ratio. So um, I guess some of the points I had as to why, why you need to care about these ratios, um, if your bank is just going to review them at the end of the year. Um, if you just wait for your accountant, I guess, to do your financial statements and wait for the bank to look at them and ask questions, you're kind of writing a test without studying and hoping, and hoping that you get a passing grade. So it's important to go through these with your advisors, advisors uh, be, know how to calculate them, uh, have the financial systems available or in, and the records available that will give you the numbers that you need to calculate those. Um, again, it, Studies have proven that there's a direct relationship between the financial knowledge level of a producer and their profitability. So it's important that you have that financial knowledge level as a producer. I'll now turn things over to Jeff for the exciting part of the presentation. All right, here we go. I'm going to break it down into three a three-step approach that uh, you could take, and again, uh, everything can be different. The first step would be consider the financial impact of the asset that we're looking at. So what is the useful life of the asset? Should, this should be considered when deciding to use cash flow or to borrow. So if you're going to buy a tractor, you're going to buy land. Should you use your current line of credit to buy a tractor? Should you use a loan? If you're going to buy land, should I use a term loan? The useful life of the asset also, if you're going to borrow, determines the length of time that you can borrow the money from the bank. For example, land, borrow one to 30 years, four wheel drive tractor, with the costs that they are today, one to 10 years. Shop, bins, one to 15 years. Is the asset revenue generating? If yes, will the additional revenue cover the repayment if I have to borrow? If no, can my operation afford the additional payment? As we'll see, a dollar per acre analysis. Does the asset purchase um, help with efficiency? So will the asset save time? So will it speed up harvest, therefore increase the chance of a better grade? We've done this work with uh, farms up in the peace country. Surprisingly, another combine, crazy expensive, but we get the crop off sooner. We get a number one grade versus a number three, actually paid for the combine. Will the asset save on fuel use, therefore help recover some of the costs? Will the asset save on maintenance and repair to negate the risk of downtime? If buying land, will the additional equipment inventory, will we have if we're buying land, will we need additional equip equipment as well as storage for the inventory? If, you, uh, if your existing equipment or your growing season can manage additional land, then an additional land purchase helps you spread the cost of your capital investment over a, a per acre basis, therefore giving you economies of scale. So all questions that I would want to engage with you one-on-one -on -one, and I would encourage you to think about when you're looking at your asset purchases. Step two. Build and know your cost of production. Uh, this is just a quick spreadsheet that uh, some of my clients and I came together with. This is his there. Um, dry land and irrigation rotation. It was from barley, wheat, durum, canola, chickpeas, and uh, chickpeas and regular peas. Barley silage, corn silage. So again, it's, it's kind of busy. What we're after at the end of the day is, okay, how many acres are we after? What is your five-year yield? 
I don't want to know what you think the yield's going to be this next year because you don't know and I don't know and the weatherman's 90% wrong. So um, hopefully there's no weather people in here. I'm just joking around. Okay, this is uh, an estimate of what we think fall prices could look like. Uh, there's your gross income per acre. What's your cost per acre? That's truly what I'm after. Do you know what it costs you thoroughly from A to B to bring that crop to market? This is where that capital purchase, if you're going to borrow, the payment has to be layered in here. The interest cost has to be layered in here. And if you want to be able to replace in the future, you can even include amortization. Here on this farming operation, if this was you, your dry land dollar, net dollars per acre would average out at 52. Your irrigated acres would average out at 548. So does that meet your goal as a farming operation? Does that help you get to where you want to go? Are you able to put some money aside? Do you have money left for purchases? Is that going to cover your payments? The last one and my favorite one is uh, as a young lender trying to figure out what to do when a, a large intimidating farmer would come sit across you. You're green out of university. You don't have a foggy clue what you're doing, but this guy wants to borrow money for a tractor. Okay, I'm going to do my best. Alberta Agriculture at the time and through knowledge of working with credit guys, they have benchmarks of your key ratios that they want to see from specific operations. So as Dennis looked at, um, there's the current ratio, debt to equity, equity to asset, that's just a fun one, but I won't explain that one today, debt service. So what you do then, the third step, the financial impact is layered into your existing financial scorecard to see if the purchase is helpful or not. If you're not one who's familiar with a debt service ratio of one and a half, 1.2, 92, with, is a working capital, one and a half, 0.42, 0.55. As you start with someone who's also doesn't do with numbers, next best thing, put a color to it. Green, go, yellow, caution, red, stop. So if anything, we added a new column here. The purchase, if this was you, from a current ratio perspective, it's going to help us. From a uh, debt, to debt to equity ratio, it's going to get us into the yellow zone. From a debt service ratio, can't do it. So from a mitigating risk point of view, you got to weigh out the colors if you don't know what the numbers are. Just example. I'm going to give you a practical, practical example of doing this with land. So here's just a spreadsheet I built. You kind of get into building spreadsheets when you don't want to redo it on your calculator a number of times. Build something where you can just plug the number once and then see what it does. Okay, new land. It's going to generate me $24,000 net. That's $150 an acre on a quarter section. It's going to have an oil lease on it. So I'm going to get $26,500 net out of this quarter. It's going to cost me $350,000 to buy that quarter. If I borrow the money over 10, 15, 20, or 25, that's my principal payment. My one-year, two-year, three-year, four-year, five-year rates. You can't hold me to rates, right, Ken? They're changing every day. Okay, now, the total payment, let's just choose a column, 20 years. Principal and interest with a one-year fix is 26250 See where there's a red dot in the right place? Okay. But your projected income, remember, is twenty six five. Okay. If I borrow that money over 10 years, I got to subsidize that payment by 17,000 from something somewhere else on my farm. 15 years, five grand difference, not bad. The yellow tells you when the land is making enough to make its own payment. I'm f in this scenario here, I'd actually be forced, if, this, if I was just relying on this land to make its payment, it's gotta be 25 years or else I gotta subsidize this on top of that I do have to be making 150 bucks an acre. Okay. Now, this is extremely busy, and I apologize for that, but it's, it's, it is straightforward at the end of the day. The left-hand side, yeah, your left, is the balance sheet. This is an existing balance sheet, completely made up of somebody, where we talked about your current assets, your land assets, your liabilities, your long-term debt, and your equity box. At the very bottom, we calculate the ratios that you pull out of your balance sheet. Current ratio and debt to equity. Again, if you don't know the number that tells you it's good, bad, or ugly, I colored it. It's green. 
This is a good balance sheet. Now we add that land that we just bought for 350000 Where do we add it? We add it right here, property, plant of equipment. Now there's still something else that comes along with the land. You got the lease income, which is cash, and you got the, rev and you got the inventory. Remember, 24000 It's going to come off of my property? Well, that's actually inventory in my bin. So you've propped up your current assets, you propped up your assets, but now we also have a payment. So we have a current payment. I got to make a payment every year. So I've bumped up my current liabilities. Now my debt is my, is three, I borrowed 350, but the reason the debt doesn't say 350 is because I'm going to pay off 17.5 this year. That's my current portion. All in all, the effect on your balance sheet when you make this land purchase is it doesn't affect your current ratio hardly at all. What it does do is it pulls down your debt to your equity. So you went from having 36 cents of debt for every dollar of equity to having 45 cents of debt for every dollar of equity. Why did it go, why did it get worse? I didn't put any cash down for the land. I just borrowed from my equity box, okay? Puts you into the yellow. Is yellow entirely bad? No. Nope but it's meant to make you think twice about you before you do it, just in case there could be other effects. What does this do to your income statement? Okay, here's my current sales, here's my current expenses, this is my net income, my EBITDA. If anybody doesn't know EBITDA, earnings before, interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, most important number for you to want to learn on your farming operation. It drives so much. Okay, my EBITDA, 205000 Where does it come from? Take your net income, add back interest, add back amortization. That's how much money this farm has to make its, cap, make its loan payment obligations, make its purchase improvements if they don't borrow. Okay, so debt service ratio. Uh, Dennis highlighted that. Banks focus almost entirely on this one. Basically, it's ingrained in you. It's stamped. It's kind of tattooed on your body when you're a banker. Debt service ratio is 1.52 prior to the purchase. What does the land do to my income statement? It adds revenue from the crop. It adds lease revenue from the whatever's going on in your land pipeline or otherwise. Now it adds crop inputs. It adds fuel and oil cost. It adds an interest cost from the previous spreadsheet. Then I also have additional property taxes. What's the net impact on my net income from my farm? I gained $250 okay, out of this scenario. How does that affect my debt service ratio? I go from 1.52 down to 1.32. So is that bad? Well, you're getting into kind of the yellow range, but the yellow range again is to make you think twice about what you're doing. If you're in the green, again, then you're off to the races, but as long as you know that. Now, bank covenants start at 1.05 all the way up to 1.25. Depends on your financial institution, depends what area of agriculture that you're in. So, at the end of the day, every farm operation is unique, therefore the an analytics will be different. Take the time to know your numbers, for example, cost of production and financial statements. Using a financial health scorecard can help you determine if this is the right time or way to add to your farming operation. You layer it in, do some colors, see what it looks like. So, thank you. Well, thanks, Jeff and Dennis. Uh, we've got just a minute or two. I don't know if there's such a thing as a quick financial question, but if anybody had a quick financial question, did I see your hand? Okay, go ahead. What, what are your thoughts in a year like this, the past 15 months, where we've seen a two and a half to three X increase in input costs? And, you know, in the non, non marketing board commodities, you know, fluctuations of 250, 300% in commodity output prices. How, do, how are bank financial institutions viewing those things in a quick ratio? Basically, from a, um, from a sensitivity point of view, it's a great question. At the end of the day, I, as an advisor, I want to sit down and look at your operations capabilities so, or benchmark your farm to know what it's capable of. Five years is the best, but if your scale of your farm changed in five years, we have to go back to what what history do we have with what it current looks like? So to deal with that anomaly 
um, again, because I'm a bit of a spreadsheet geek, I would want to build out your farm. I would want to say, this is what my five-year average is. This is what last year's inputs were. Now that I'm going to have an increase, if I look at fall prices and I look at what I'm going to have, so we did this on another farm. We had to layer in 50 bucks an acre just because of fertilizer going up for this upcoming year. What do you need to make per acre to make your loan payments? We layer that all in there, and then we move around the cost per acre to see where you have to be. Meaning, where do I have to be with my marketing? I specifically have to be on peas. You got to be right on top of that one. It's at not very much cost per acre to put that in. You get nitrogen fixing, but you can really quickly get underwater on $6 peas. You might need eight to 10. Maybe your cost production is better. So sorry if I'm jumping around on your question. There's a few different factors, but really got to nail down that cost. So if you're grain per acre, and then come up with what the marketing plan needs to be, meaning look at future prices so that I can make my goals financially and make my payments. Did, did that help answer your question? I hope. Yeah, I think what you're kind of saying is if, if you know your input costs are here based on current commodity prices, you better have a sale for some current commodities. Yes. That price. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And then where are the banks going to be at? Banks love five-year average. So you got you got all kinds of tolerance to have a bad or you got you got to have a bad year. You, you have tolerance. There's ways to work with that. Just be full disclosure with the numbers. They'd rather see it than read it and figure it out themselves. That's the most important thing. But, but yeah, yeah. Go ahead, sir. how does the forecast for your ratios change when you're projecting a change in interest rates over the next? Oh yeah. Let's go ten years. Yeah, I was just having the conversation in the back about that. What's coming up with interest rate hikes is like massive. So when you're running, when we've been running scenarios on expanding farms for the last couple of years, you should be using three to 4% rates. Even though we had fortunate um, record low interest rates, you should be running a rate a percent above. So to get back to your question, where does that layer into? It's, it's massive. Like if there's a million dollars in debt and a 1% increase, you now got a $10,000 cost per million that you didn't have to account for before. So, yeah. Did I help answer your question? Sorry, I know it's a big one. I'd be happy to talk to you face to face and put something up after. Sorry, thanks. I don't see any other hands waving. So with that, uh, and I know uh, Dennis is around here. Jeff, you're around for a little bit if people want to chat to you one-on-one. -on -one. So let's put our hands together and thank Dennis and Jeff for their presentation today.